Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Proper theology is vital. We need to understand and embrace the doctrines that the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, reveal. Because if we don't understand right theology, biblical doctrines, then we are going to be led astray and embrace things that are most displeasing. And improper theology will rob you of power. It will hinder God's provision in your life. It will cause you to say things and do things that are in opposition to the purposes of God. And instead of being an instrument for his glory and accomplishing his will, you will become, by de facto, a servant of the enemy. He will manipulate you. He will cause you to do the things that you ought not do. Yes, truth is vital. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms in Psalm 8. Now, we're going to come across a, a doctrine here, and it has to do with the authority of man. What did God give to man? And when I say man, I'm speaking of humankind. I'm speaking of, of both male and female. What did God entrust to humanity? And how should we understand it? Now, we'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to give you two examples that I heard in the last uh, couple weeks from individuals. They happen to be pastors in America, one in Texas and one in Atlanta. And they said things that were, were simply heresy. Now, they have large congregations. They have a very significant platform that they, that they share to, and that's why it's so tragic. Let me give you the first example. A pastor in, in Texas was speaking about redemption, and he gave an account, an illustration, like there was a conversation between God, God the Father, and Satan. And God wants to redeem this, this young girl, and God is saying to Satan, what's it going to cost me? What, what do I have to do? Because I don't want you to have her. I want her. And Satan and God kind of barters back and forth until God, based upon Satan's suggestion, receives as payment the blood of the only begotten Son of God. Now, I hope you hear and know how heretical that is. God does not barter with Satan. Satan has absolutely no authority in God's presence. God did not pay redemption to Satan. God paid redemption for righteousness because of the righteousness that God has established. Satan's not part of this equation. And when this pastor gave this very emotional illustration at the end, when, when he revealed God gave his son to Satan, everyone applauded. Again, that is heresy. God did not give his only begotten son, Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus, to Satan. That's not what we find in the Bible whatsoever. So it's heresy 
And it is shameful that a congregation would applaud such a unbiblical illustration. Secondly, I heard this literally last night. Pastor in, in Georgia was, was teaching, and the, the name of his sermon series is this, How to Get What You Want. Now, now right there, there's a problem. We should not seek what we want, but we should seek the will of God. And I want to be fair. In the midst of this, he was sharing about how, obviously, the will of God is, is good. That's what we should want. But here's the problem. And there was numerous problems with this message theologically. But, but this is one of the things that he said several times. He repeated that. And he was saying, you know, if you're not a Christian, if, if, if you don't believe the, the Bible, that's, that's okay. This message can still help you out. Well, that's a false statement. Biblical truth needs to be given to a person that is redeemed, that has been regenerated. If a person has not yet experienced salvation, he is not going to be able to connect with the scriptural truth. And here's what he's saying. He said, as I remarked more than two or three times, he says, you're going to find what you really want, and the will of God is not really that far apart. Now, hear this. He's, he said, you may not be a Christian. You may not be a follower of, of Messiah Yeshua. But what you really want isn't so far from the will of God. Let me affirm to you it is. What does the scripture say? The scripture says that God's will is not my will. That his thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. There is a, a big, a humongous difference between the will of sinful man and the will of holy, the one and only holy God. And the problem is this. People sit week in and week out and they hear heresy, doctrines that are not established in the scripture. And, and no one says anything. And it just shows us the, the spiritual condition, how truth is absent today in so many congregations. And this is true within Christianity and we're going to see but it's also true in regard to Judaism. I want to deal in a moment with a view that Judaism teaches, and that's this, that the heavens belong to God and that God has entrusted this world, the earth, to man. Now, there's scriptures that, that, that speak to this, but here's the problem. When you go into Judaism, in a, a deeper way, they will make statements such as this. For example, there is a, a very well-known Rav, that is a rabbi. He lived approximately 2,000 years ago. Rashbi, that is an acronym for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from Miron in the Galilee area. And he's revered the largest event in Israel takes place at as his tomb, usually in the summertime. And what do we know? Well, this is what we need to understand. What he was revered about was his power. And it was said, God can decree something, but Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he can undo it. And what he, Shimon Bar Yochai, Decrees God cannot undo. Now, that is about as heretical as you get. But understand within Judaism, when I speak of Judaism, obviously I'm speaking about Orthodox Judaism. Why is that? 
because every other expression of traditional Judaism, I mean Reform Judaism or Conservative Judaism or this far-out Reconstructionist Judaism, all of those have no authoritative texts. So they believe whatever they want to believe. It varies within one congregation and those within that congregation. There is no order. There's no doctrine whatsoever. So we just set those aside. At least with Orthodox Judaism, there are authoritative texts. And at least you have a congruency on what Orthodox Judaism teaches foundationally. An agreement, a strong agreement. Now, how certain laws are, are followed and the strictness, that can vary within different groups, but the base law does not change. Obviously, in a few examples, there are different perspectives for that law, but by and law, there is agreement. Now, I want to speak about one other thing, and that is we need to always have the Scripture as the foundation, and not simply quoting a few passages to support what the teacher is saying. But here's the key. It's not that I speak and then I turn to the Word of God and quickly find a verse that kind of supports what I want to say. That is not biblical teaching. That is where deceit comes in because it's rooted in the, the idea that, that I know what's best and I'll use because I'm a Bible teacher, I'll use the Bible to support what, what I want to get across. That is dangerous. And this individual from Georgia, I mean, he spent more time on a book that was written by a Mormon rather than on the text of the Word of God on Scripture. And when you look at that message, he was saying that this Mormon book, or at least a book written by a Mormon, had a greater impact, at least for this sermon, than the Word of God. In fact, he read considerably more from that book, and it was the foundation. It was what he was admonishing people to get a copy and read that and do what, what this Mormon is, is telling you to do. It is dangerous. It is outlandish. Why aren't we paying more attention to the Word of God? Well, that's what we believe in. The authority of the Scripture and how wicked and deceitful our heart is. And we constantly, even though we have been regenerated, we constantly struggle with, with discernment. We need the Holy Spirit to assist us, Him to help us with discernment so we're not led astray. And the more that we study the Scripture, the more that we understand the right doctrine, proper theology, we won't be led astray or say things that are not biblically true. Well, again, look with me to where we are today in this study. We are in the book of Psalms and Psalm 8. We begin once more with an inscription. It says to the chief musician or to the choir director, however you want to translate, Lam Natsech. And it says, upon the getit, getit more than likely is a musical instrument that we don't know much about. And then the inscription ends with the statement, Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. Now, that's the first verse in the Hebrew Bible. It's usually put above the first verse in the English Bible. So when I quote verses, there'll be one off. I'm going to verse 2, and you're probably going to verse 1 in your Bible. But same words. We begin verse 2 in the Hebrew. Hashem Adonenu. Now, I use the word Hashem, which literally means the name. And it is a way of showing uh, reverence. 
and acknowledging the holiness of the name of God. This is the name with four letters, the yud He vav He, that is, is usually understood as the term Yehovah or Yehovah, meaning Jehovah God. And it is wrong grammatically to use the term Yahweh. That is incorrect. In, in the Jewish community, in order to show respect, we simply say the name or in Hebrew, Hashem. The next word is the word Adonenu, which means our Lord or our Master. So here we're speaking about the Lord, our Master. And then the second part of the verse says, Ma Adir Shimcha. How? And the word Adir, not to be confused with the word Nadir, Nadir means rare. Adir means that which is marvelous or wonderful and it does have a degree of uniqueness so we could think of rare as in unique but it's not the normal word for something that is rare but it speaks about marvelous wonderful awesome so he says David is speaking Lord my our master how marvelous is your name in all the earth. Then he goes on and says how you have place or given, and the word here is hod. Hod, and it's hodcha, so your hod, and the word hod, probably one of the best ways to translate it is majesty. And what we have here is parallelism. Remember, we're talking about Hebrew poetry. The Psalms are Hebrew poetry. What's the number one characteristic? Parallelism. So we see that, that the word adir and the word hod are parallel to one another. They're similar. They're synonyms. So how awesome and how majestic is what he's saying about God over the earth. How marvelous is your name in all the earth and you have set your majesty above or over the heavens. Obviously, heavens and earth are parallel here. So we begin by speaking about how unique, special, how wonderful, marvelous God is. And his character is, is unique in this world, in this earth. And his majesty which is a reflection of his character, is greater or above the heavens. Now move on to verse, verse 2 in English, 3 in Hebrew. Because of this, he says, from the mouth of, of young children, olelim. From the mouth of young children, and this may be very young children, like babies or infants. And the next word, is those who at least are, are nursing. So from the mouth of babes and nursing children, it says, you have founded, you have established, and this word is power. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying that, and this is also quoted in the New Covenant, when Messiah is, is speaking before the, the religious leaders, some of the religious leaders, and they're not happy with the fact that, that there are young children who are praising Messiah, recognizing Yeshua, that is Jesus, as the Messiah, the son of David. And they're saying something as Hoshana, you may know it better as Hosanna, which means God save us, please. It's a, a deep and respectful request for help. And this verse, when the leaders, not all of them, but those who were there, when they say, you know, quiet down your disciples and these young children, Messiah quotes this verse and says, you know what? Have you not read where it said in the word of God? Messiah always points us back to the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, the, the Old Testament. And he says, have you not read the verse where it says, 
out of or from the mouths of, of children, young children, and nursing children, he says that, that God has established power. What does this teach us? It teaches us that, that proper praise is, is a catalyst for bringing heavenly power into a situation. Now, I said proper praise, and this ties us right back to where we began with, and that is, unless you have a proper understanding of God, unless you know the biblical God, you can't praise Him properly. Your worship is not a, a divinely inspired worship based and founded upon truth. Therefore, improper worship is going to hinder God's power being released. And that is why I believe that, that the congregation, the body of Messiah, the church, is so ineffective today. Because we do not have good theology. Without good theology, we do not praise God properly, and we will not see Him putting forth power in our situation and our circumstances. Keep reading. Second part of verse 3. And notice what this power is, is related to. He says, on account of your enemies. Now, this is important. Because this power that's rooted in praise, it is a weapon against the enemies of God. I was speaking, oh, about a year ago, I believe, and I, I gave a, a statement which says, you should make sure that your enemies are the enemies of God. That's how you can be assured that you're on the right side and your petitions for help and that your praise will, in fact, bring about assistance from God. That's what this verse is teaching us. So he says, keep reading. He says, on account of your enemies, what does God do? Now, again, we have parallelism. We have the word sorer. It's in the plural, sorerim, which speaks about an enemy or an opponent. And then in the second part of, of this, this passage, we have the word oyev, which is a synonym for enemy or, or opponent a synonym in Hebrew, oh yeah, for sorer. So he says here, on account of your enemies, for, and then he has the word, lehashbit. What's lehashbit? Well, probably most of your Bibles will have the word for destruction. But do you know the word lehashbit comes from the word Shabbat. And it means to bring something to a stop, but with a purpose. See, if you want God to bring problems and the activity of your enemies to a stop, you want him to destroy that, understand. The purpose of that is for praise. You say, God, help me with this problem. Because this problem, this enemy, this obstacle is hindering me from, from giving you praise. It is making it difficult. Help me overcome and have victory so that my praise can then be impacted by that. So he says, to bring to an end, to stop the enemy, and he says, mit nakem, what's that? That there would be vindication or probably the better word is vengeance. So that there would be a stopping, a ceasing, and not just a destruction, but, and this can be a sweet word when you are in the right spiritual condition, and that is vengeance. Vengeance belongs to God, but he shares it in, with his people. So it's a wonderful thing. Vengeance is his, but when God acts in retribution, his people are blessed by it. Verse, verse 4 in Hebrew, 3 in English. He says, for, I, and it's simply the word for seeing or looking. I realize that some Bibles, they write down the word for consider. It's not the word consider. Bechashev. It's not that word. 
It's not the word to observe something. It is a very simple or common word in Hebrew for simply looking or seeing. So David says, for I will look, and the implication is, at your heaven. And what does David say the heavens are? He says, ma'asei etzbe otecha, which is a, a work of your fingers. So God with his finger, and that means, I mean, the heavens. And when it's talking about heavens, it's talking about uh, the vastness of, of the the universe, but also the glory of the heavens, that other dimension. Now, you get in a spaceship or a rocket like they went to the moon, and you come into outer space, but you're not coming into the heavens in the sense of the domain of God. That's a different dimension. And I believe that that's what David is really emphasizing, not ignoring the vastness and the glory and the awesomeness of God's creation in the outer space, but, but also the glorious aspects of heaven. And he says here, the moon and the stars which you have established. So God, he has created all things. He has established it, and this word means to set it in proper place to establish it now this word is also related to something that's a base and you put something on its base so it speaks about God's creation with wisdom with order that reflects the the majesty and the wisdom and the knowledge the perfect knowledge of God verse verse 5 after speaking about how awesome majestic is God's creation the heavens and the earth now he's going to speak about you and me humanity and he says and I like this there's a great song I believe based upon this verse he says ma enosh ki tizkarini what is man that that you remember him and here again, when it says here the word enosh, it's speaking about humanity, not just some specific individual, but all of humanity. And this just supports what, what Yeshayahu Isaiah says, and that is that we have been wonderfully made. And when you look at the human body, you find just how, how unbelievably it has been made. And let me say, there is absolutely no way whatsoever that, that a human body, in the way that it has been made, could ever be the outcome of that which is random. When we look at creation, all of creation, but especially human beings, there is nothing random. The stupidity, and I want to say this, it is virtual stupidity to think that, that we have become the outcome of, of selection. That certain things were there and over time, well, those things give away because they're inadequate and the good things stay. And this took place over billions and billions of years. That can never be. First of all, there is absolutely, I want to say this, absolutely no scientific evidence based upon fact for dating this world in billions or millions or hundreds of thousands of years. When you look at the, the assumption that's based upon, it is highly flawed. So we do not see a basis for much of what the so-called scientists say about creation. And when we look at some, some proof cases, for example, I remember that there was, I don't know, about 30 years ago, a volcano in the state of Washington, I believe, Mount St. Helens, erupted. And they said, oh, it would take hundreds of years for, for things to go back. And they were saying how long this would be, how long this would be, and how long. And one of the things that they estimated 150 years 
It was about seven years later. And we see that there's an oil spill and they'll say, oh, this will do damage and it will take this many years before things go back. And we find that in a relatively short time, much shorter than they said, things have been restored. God is marvelous, wonderful, awesome, and he can restore things. And one of the things we see biblically is God is continuously bringing about restoration to his creation. Now, what the world groans for, I'm speaking about the earth. See, realize something. And the Hasidim, get this right. It breaks in Hasidic thought, Hasidic thought, thought breaks creation into those things which can speak, those things which can, can, can move that are animalistic. Most animals, right, don't speak. A parrot can mimic, but a parrot can't have a conversation. So there's that which speaks, that which is animal, that which is plant, and that which is domain, which is silent like a rock. But that's from a human standpoint. But, but Hasidically and spiritually, we know something. We know from the book of Romans that, that the earth cries out, not for restoration, but for redemption. A very big difference between restoration and redemption. Having something restored simply puts it back in a previous condition. And it can be a healing. But understand the difference. Now, I'm, at least as far as I know, relatively healthy for, for my age. And, and I might go and be 100 years old and there will be a lot of changes. But God could, if he wanted to, he could restore me back to that, that ripe young age of, of 25. And I could always do that, just get old and be restored back to being a fit 25-year-old. Well, that's restoration. It has nothing to do with redemption. Because redemption makes us into, and here's the key, a new creation. And ultimately, that redemption is going to function to bring me and make me into a kingdom creation. So I don't want just constantly being restored back to the prime of my life. No, I want not restoration. I want the full outcome of redemption. And that's why it's so important that we understand the significance of these words. So go back to our text. He says here, look at verse 4 in the English, verse 5 in Hebrew. He says, speaking to God, Basically, what is man, humankind, that you remember him and the son of man? And here it's simply a term. Ben Adam is another Hebrew way of saying humanity. So what is humanity? That, and I would, would circle, whatever comes, comes, continues on in your translation, I'd circle that. Now, just one word in Hebrew. It's the word tifkat denu. It has a suffix on it that is third person singular. So, so him, that you, and I don't know how it's translated in your Bible that you visit him, but, but I've mentioned this word before in other teachings, especially in the book of Jeremiah and also I believe in Isaiah, we find, find this word repeated. It's the pe kuf dalit. And in modern Hebrew, we use it for, we go to a bank, making a deposit. And what it can also be spoken of is visiting for the will of God. In the book of Jeremiah, this same word can be used for God visiting to punish or visiting to redeem a people, to bless a people. But here's what I want you to see about it. It is a word of great great uh, intensity it is a word and where what i would use to help us understand it and describe it is that god is all in he is highly investing in something that is going to have 
the necessary outcome. It can be judgment, and the outcome is destruction. It can be punishment, and the outcome is going to be repentance. Or it can be God entering into something for the purpose of redemption or restoration. But it's a powerful word, and that's why it says, and, and the Son of Man, humanity, that, that you invest in him, that you visit him, that you, that you act with him. And who is humanity? We'll move on to the next verse, verse 6. Speaking about how God has made, made him humanity, and it's a word, chaser. Chaser means uh, lacking, or in this case, to be lower than, to be not of its full level. So he says, you've made him lower, not to the full degree, as a little bit lower than, and we have the word, I'm going to say it in Hebrew, the word Elohim. Why is that important? Well, if you look at most translations, they might say angels and such. Some have God or some will say the gods. It's a horrible. There's no gods. There's only one. All the rest are idols and false gods. But here's what he's saying. Remember, we've talked about how that word Elohim refers to God in a general sense, but, but it hints to his judgment. And we've talked about how God sits in the court of Elohim, meaning this angelic uh, uh, court where, where things are decreed and acted upon. So when he says here that he's made us a little bit, we lack just a little bit less than, than this term Elohim. It's not in reference to God himself. We're far, far, far removed from God. But this angelic, and remember, we, those who are believers, we're going to judge the angels in our redemptive state. So it's just a simple way of saying how God has truly invested in his creation of, of men and women of humankind. And it says, continue on, Chavod vehadar, glory and splendor, you have crowned him. And then he says, and this is the verse that I wanted to get at, where it says, Tam shulehu be ma'aseyadecha. Ma'aseyadecha is the works of your hand. So God has done something, and this word, it's the word where we get the Hebrew word memshalah. Memshalah is government. It speaks of dominion or ruling over. And what this Scripture says is that God has given man, humankind, dominion over, over the works of his hand. Specifically, he says, you have placed all, everything, meaning in this world, under his feet. So humanity, men and women, humanity, we have been given a great responsibility. That, that God's creation on this planet has been entrusted to us. Now, don't go the direction of standard Orthodox Judaism, meaning that what we decree, God has to agree with here because we're in control here. That is a false teaching. You cannot rightly use that scripture based upon many other scriptures to arrive at that heretical conclusion. So we don't embrace that false teaching that, that a, a righteous one, when they use that righteous one, they mean a great spiritual one in someone else's estimation, can decree something. God's got to say, well, my hands are tied. He decreed it. He's, he's spiritually a giant, so I've got to go along with it. Heresy, false teaching, not the right way of understanding this verse of Scripture. It simply says that God has done something. He has given us dominion. We have a call, and that call comes with a responsibility over creation. Secondly, move on to verse 8 in Hebrew, verse 7. Speaking about creation, he uses the word 
tsone. This is the word probably a reference to flocks. And also alafi means thousands, but here it's probably talking about flock and cattle. Sheep and cattle. All of them. And also the beast of, and notice this next word, it's a word, not Shaddai, but Sadai. Sadai, now I wrote myself a note. And I remember what I wrote on it. I still put it there just in case I forget. But this word, Sade, appears 333 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, in different forms, a variety of different forms. This identical form appears seven times. Four times it's translated the field, even though the definite article, the word the, is not there. And also, it's translated three times plural, even though there's nothing plural necessarily about it, but we see that also translated. And that's true not only within the Christian translations, but also I checked several Jewish translations of the Hebrew Bible, and there's not really much difference between how the rabbinical authorities render this word and how the Christian authorities render this word. Now, what I would say is this, is that uh, we need to remember that, that the vowel pointings, which can have a, a big implication to this, are not in the original text. They were placed there by men. If men do something, there's a chance that there could be an heir. And those vowel pointings were not put in until about 1,100 years after the, the last book of the Old Testament was completed. So over a 1,000 years passed from when the Scripture ended the Old Testament being written. And when those in the, the city of Tiberia wrote these, these vow pointings. So not going to go much into this. You can do a great study about some of the implications of this, how we should rightly understand it. If that vow pointing is a patak or a kamatz, if it's first person, if this is a different or a variant of the word sade, uh, all those things. This is what theses are, are based upon, but we're not going to, to go much into that. Look on to the next verse, verse 9 in the Hebrew text, 8 in English. The bird, and it's the fowl, the fowl of the heavens and the fish of the sea. So we've talked about certain creations, these flocks and cattles and also he says the, the beasts, the animals of the fields, and the word here for beast usually means like uh, domesticated animals. But in verse, verse 8 in the English, he says the fowl of the heavens, we can just translate the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, over archot yamim, or yamim, yamim, which is don't want to say the word for day, it's a word for seas. And what it simply points about here is how birds travel. And they travel over the sea, and how fish travel in the sea. And the message here is that when the birds migrate, they go a, a specific way. And fish as well, they travel and they go from one place to another place to migrate, to, to reproduce. And they go there consistently. They're gone and they come back on time. And so all of this is under what? All of this is under the authority of God. And why this verse is there hermeneutically is to teach us something. And I use the phrase frequently, Tal Vehomer. Hope you know what that means. If, if this is so, then certainly this other situation is true. And what he's saying here is if, if the birds and the fish obey God and travel along the right, right pathways, how much more so? We who are made just a little bit lower than, than these angels, how much more so should we obey God and travel in the paths that God has for us? Well, look now to our last verse, 
verse 10 in Hebrew, verse 9 in English. We began, we go back to the first first statement after the inscription. It's Hashem Adonenu, Lord our God, or Master. Same thing here. Hashem Adonenu, the Lord our Master. And then he says, and it's repetition, Ma Adir Shimcha Bekoha Aretz. How marvelous, how awesome, how wonderful is your name. Speaking about the name of the Lord Most High, our Master. How wonderful is your name in all the earth. And I believe that that verse is repeated for one main reason, and that's this. To teach us that our responsibility and if we're going to fulfill our responsibility, responsibility, be given what we need to carry it out, we need to have one objective. And that is to proclaim in word and deed. Our responsibility is to make known how marvelous the name, the character of the God of Israel and His only begotten Son, Messiah Yeshua. How marvelous is His name. That name, that majestic name, Yeshua, is in all the earth. And I'll close with this. If you pray daily, and this will change your life, if you pray sincerely and consistently, God, what I want is to be used by you to, to proclaim your majesty, majesty in all the earth. I want my words, I want my actions, I want everything in my life, my stewardship, everything to bear testimony that your name is wonderful, that you are marvelous. If that is the foundation of your prayer life, if that is the desire of your, your heart, and if you will pray to God saying, God, help me, to achieve that, you are going to find, I guarantee it, you are going to find God getting intimately involved, actively involved in your life. You will begin to see things differently from a new perspective, his perspective, a right perspective. And your objective is not going to be anything other than to live in service to him that he would be well pleased with you. And you're not going to be manipulated by saying, I want to get what I want, and I believe what I want is really close to what God wants for me. No. You're going to recognize that as false teaching, as that which moves people away from the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and blinds them to the truth of this book. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.